some parts. And that's why the blood supply remain the same. So the blood supply to the lower part of the upper vertebral body and to the upper part of the lower vertebral body is the same. And that's why infection, most of the cases in tuberculosis would involve the adjacent parts of two vertebral bodies. Now, uh, direct extension uh, can cause infection, but it will really, really cause tuberculosis. It will usually cause pyogenic infection. Now, there are certain risk factors, uh, for example, malnutrition, drug abuse, HIV, malignancy, liver diseases, renal failure, septicemia, diabetes. So practically all those conditions which reduces the immunity of the person can actually predispose toward developing tuberculosis. And this is the reason that even in developed countries, tuberculosis is on the rise because of increasing the HIV infections. Now, how will these patients present? This is infection. So any infection, the most common uh, symptom would be pain. So the pain usually is localized to that area of infection. And there is tenderness in that area. There is rigidity. And in about 50% of the cases, it is associated with fever. So like all the classical signs of uh, inflammation would be there. Uh, it may not be very acute. It's like a chronic infection, but I have never seen a patient who has got active infection and who is not tender or who doesn't have pain. The pain sometimes can be referred pain as well. Uh, that would depend on the nerve root involving the uh, But the local pain and the local tenderness and the local rigidity would always be there. Now, as the disease advances, then there are neurological symptoms which develop. And these neurological symptoms, again, depends on the location. Now, there can be symptoms because of the swelling by itself. And those, again, depend on the location of the infection. For example, in the cervical spine, the swelling or the large abscess which is produced there would have its own effect in the form of uh, difficulty in breathing, difficulty in swallowing. Similarly, in the lumbar spine, the uh, abscess itself can track down uh, into the source muscle. And so all the, the flexors of the hip joint, they, that would become painful uh, because of the effect of the abscess. Now, sometimes the abscess by itself causes ischemia. And the vessels, the small vessel that it affects sometimes may cause actually sudden onset of paraplegia because of the ischemia of the vessels, which is, which is supplying the spinal cord. Now, in advanced cases, the abscess may, or the infection may actually involve the epidural space. And if that happens, then the neurological dysfunction becomes rapid and very severe. Now, once the, the, the natural history of the disease is that this will gradually destroy the uh, vertebral bodies. And when the vertebral bodies are destroyed, the weight-bearing capacity of the spine is reduced. Now, most of the time, it involves the paradiscal region. Then the next common area would be the anterior part of the vertebral body, then the central part of the vertebral body, and then the posterior part of the vertebral body. And in less than 5% of the cases, this would involve the posterior elements. Now, when the anterior part of the vertebral bodies are destroyed, the weight is still passing there. So what happens that the bone cannot sustain the weight and it collapses. When it collapses, it produces a deformity. So in advanced cases, there would be a deformity. Now, when the disease progresses, then gradually it would involve the spinal cord, either by direct extension or by the pressure effects of the abscess or by the necrotic tissue or by the sequestrum which is produced and would produce neurological symptoms. Now, the deformity itself would produce its own symptoms. 
And this is more uh, relevant in case of healed uh, infections. When the infection is healed, and particularly in those cases where they are treated conservatively, the deformity would persist. And many times the deformity, even if the infection is healed, it would progress with time. This is particularly more common in children. So the infection is still is, is healed, and the ESR and CRP and inflammatory marker, they are all down, but the deformity would be progressing. And this produces sagittal imbalance. And sagittal imbalance is the worst kind of deformity in the spine. And this by itself can lead to the development of neurological compromise, even if the disease has healed and the infection has been treated several years ago. And this is called as paraplegia of late onset. Now, um, when we talk about the investigations, in about half of these cases, TLC might be elevated, but it's not alarmingly elevated. ESR and CRP are almost always elevated. ESR is a very significant uh, mark, also it's very non-specific, but the ESR would be increased in tuberculosis. And you can use this as, uh, as, a, uh, as a marker to see whether the infection is actually uh, responding to the chemotherapy or not, because if it starts responding to the chemotherapy, the ESR will start coming down. Then uh, you can take culture. The yield of the culture, again, is not very high. Uh, there are different studies which can say that the, uh, in tuberculosis, the culture is from 20 uh, uh, to 50% uh, in cases. Then there's procalcitonin, uh, if the level are more than 0.4 nanogram per ml, this is 100% specific for acute infection, but it's not very good in chronic infections. Now, uh, if you talk about the pyogenic infection, the common organism would be Staph aureus, the uh, Enterobacteriaceae, Staph epidermitis, H. influenza, E. coli, Pseudomonas, Salmonella, Now, in case in pyogenic, the symptoms are very acute. The patient is uh, very sick, uh, very painful, and it rapidly lead to destruction of the vertebral bodies and may cause damage. And tuberculosis is a bit later. Now, can anybody tell me uh, what is the first sign on X-ray in case of tuberculosis? Are you guys there? Yes, yes. yes. You've got a good crowd. Yes, sir. You must, you must have seen a lot of uh, TB spine cases. So what, what is the first sign that you can see in tuberculosis on plain x-rays? Soft, soft tissue enhancement, soft tissue swelling. No. What's your opinion? Mm, no, not much. Sano, I guess, sir. Hmm? Uh, loss of soft tissue planes. No, that is MRI. You don't see soft tissue planes in plain x-ray. There is also so, opinion on the end. The first sign of tuberculosis infection is decrease in the intervertebral disc height. That's and so. later this will involve the bodies. Now, do you know that mycobacterium do not have the uh, proteolytic enzymes? Like the pyogenic infections, where the staph aureus has got proteolytic enzymes and they destroy the protein component. They destroy the disc directly. The tuberculosis, they do not have proteolytic enzymes. So they cannot directly damage the intervertebral disc. And disc is usually the last structure which is destroyed. And many times when we operate on these patients, there will be severe destruction of the vertebral bodies, but the disc is still intact. 
but still is the first sign on plain x-ray to see is loss of intervertebral disc. And this is because, not because the disc is destroyed, it's because the end plates are destroyed. And when they are destroyed, they become soft. And when they become soft, the disc actually penetrates into the end plates, which you cannot see, and the vertebral bodies, they come close to each other. The disc is still intact, but the vertebral bodies come close to each other because the disc has penetrated into the end plates, and that's why you will see the loss of uh, disc height, the lot of intervertebral disc space. But actually, the disc is preserved till very late, and it is destroyed not because of direct damage, but because of damage to the nutrition which, is, which it is receiving from the end plates. So this is one differentiating point from pyogenic infection. In pyogenic infection, because of the proteolytic enzyme, there is severe destruction of the disc in the early part of the infection. And the, the findings on the X-ray would be the same. There would be loss of disc height. But the mechanism is the reason for this loss of disc height is different in both the infections. Now, uh, if we talk about location, the most common location is thoracolumbar junction. And then is the lumbar spine, then the thoracic spine, and the least commonly involved location would be cervical spine. Now, what are the, uh, this is the x-ray. Can you see the x-ray? Yes. Yeah. This is oh, the early, so this is the early x-ray. And all you can see here is this loss of this height. This height. Here. Exactly. So this is yeah. because of that infection. Mm -hmm. So in plain x-rays, you will hardly see uh, any, uh, changes in the early part. Later, you will start seeing these signs. Uh, it decreases in the disc height, then uh, destruction of the vertebral bodies, uh, collapse, and then deformity. Now, this is an acute infection, while this is a healed infection, and uh, once it is treated, these uh, infections usually heal by fusion or just in place. Now, the CT findings, again, they are almost, you will see almost similar information uh, as you get from the plain films, but CT is more sensitive and it can give you more detail uh, information on the anatomy. So uh, in the early part, the destruction that you cannot see on the plain X-ray, you will be able to see on the uh, CT scan. But this is not the investigation of choice in case of tuberculosis or in case of spine infection. Now, MRI is the investigation of choice. It has very high sensitivity, 82 to 96%. It has high specificity, which is from 85 to 93%. And it's very accurate. And uh, as you know, an MRI, you have T1 sequence and you have T2 sequence. And the T1, you will have low signal in the disk space or in all the area which is edematous. You will have low signal in the adjacent end plates, again, because of the edema in that area. And in the T2, you will have bright signals in all the area which is involved by the infection, particularly when there is abscess. Like in this case, this is all the abscess, this is all abscess, and this is all necrotic and sequestrum. Now, the, uh, in the contrast, uh, uh, images on T1, there would be peripheral enhancement around the fluid collection. So you will see these small abscesses and there would be peripheral enhancement there. So there is enhancement of the vertebral end plates, 
enhancement of the, so all the area of infection that will be enhanced with the contrast, particularly the margins will be enhanced. Now there's another sequence called the diffusion sequence. Uh, sequence. Uh, I'm not very familiar with it, but they say that it will show hyper intense in the acute stage and hypo intense in the chronic stage. Now, uh, things that you need to know about the MRI is that MRI findings may actually lag behind the clinical findings, meaning the clinical findings are more sensitive than the MRI findings. The patient might, might have uh, the pain and the tenderness uh, sometime before you can see the MRI signs of infection. Sometimes you will see persistently positive clinical sign and the MRI would be negative. And in that case, you should have a strong suspicion and you should have follow-up scans because the MRI may become positive after some time. Then when the uh, chemotherapy has been started and the patient would start feeling well quite some time before the MRI would show you that the disease is healing. So the symptomatic improvement would come first, then the MRI improvement. And on the MRI, the signs of the improvement would be decreased inflammatory changes in the adjacent soft tissues. And when the disease is healed, there would be a return to the expected fatty marrow signal in the involved vertebral body. Are you guys with me? Yes, sir. We are all listening yeah. to you. Yes, sir. We are with you. Okay. Now, uh, you can see here, this is the early part on, in the T1. This is the T2. And later on, this will uh, develop the deformity and there would be compression on the spinal cord. So there would be progression in the deformity, there would be progression on the spinal cord compression, there would be progression in the abscess formation, and ultimately this will lead to two things, deformity and neurological compromise. Yes, sir. So just a few words about the fungal infection. Uh, again, extremely rare, not very common. Uh, it's more common in the immunocompromised patients. So whenever you see a uh, fungal infection, always think about immunocompromised uh, conditions. And HIV is uh, becoming more and more common in Pakistan. In last one week, we received two patients of HIV, uh, which we diagnosed by routine screening. So if we were not doing routine screening, we would have missed it and we, one of us might have got infected. So just a word of cautious, HIV is becoming common. Uh, then the, uh, the more common fungal uh, organisms are candida and the aspergillus. And when you do see the x-rays and the MRIs, they're almost the same as that of pyogenic. On the T1, there would be hypo-intense uh, images in the end plates, and on T2, they would be uh, bright. But this brightness is not as bright as uh, in the pyogenic infections or when there is large abscess formation. Yes. Uh, this is uh, a slide about the diffusion uh, weighted imaging. Uh, this is more resistant to artifacts. Uh, you can see epidural abscess more clearly uh, with this sequence. Osteomyelitis can be clearly seen. The paravertebral abscesses can be clearly seen. And you can distinguish the degenerative uh, changes, uh, which sometimes becomes very confusing uh, on T1 weighted images. Then the bone scan. Uh, bone scan would, uh, naturally this is infection, so there would be increased uptake in technetium 99 scan in that area. It's uh, highly sensitive than the plain film and the C, uh, CT, but this is not specific. And the classic appearance on multiphase bone scan is increased blood flow and pool activity and associated increased uptake on the standard delayed static images. Mm -hmm. So all you can say that there is infection, but you are not sure whether this is tuberculosis or even simple inflammation can also be. Now, uh, biopsy, the yield 
uh, varies depending on the technique, depending on the tissue obtained, and from center to center, and different studies have quoted uh, results range from 30% to 91%. And biopsy can be image guided, can be CT guided, or it can be an open biopsy. So uh, when would you do biopsy? Is it mandatory to do biopsy for the diagnosis of tuberculosis? Hello? Uh, yeah. uh, no, sir, it is not. It is a clinical diagnosis. It is not a mandatory, but when the diagnosis is in doubt, we can have for a biopsy. Uh, very true. So you see, if you are working in an area which is endemic for tuberculosis, so if you have a patient with sign symptoms and x-rays and uh, ESR and uh, these hematological markers, if they all point towards tuberculosis, you can actually start uh, the ATT and then see the response. So there are actually two ways of doing it. Some people would like to confirm the infection by doing biopsy. And it has actually two advantages. Number one, you are sure that this is tuberculosis. And number two, it also gives you uh, the culture particularly nowadays with the gene expert, it gives you a result in 48 hours and it tells you whether this is rifampicin resistant or rifampicin sensitive. So it spares a lot of time uh, as compared to the empirical treatment where you are not sure that this is tuberculosis. And number two, you are not sure whether this is rifampicin sensitive or this is rifampicin resistant. And I have seen many cases of uh, uh, tuberculosis where it was actually not tuberculosis, but people start with the ATT and wait for six months, seven months, and then do biopsy because the patient is not responding, and then it turns out to be something else, but then that uh, piece of time has been lost. So in the exam, if they ask you, it's not a must to do biopsy, but if you have the facility, it's always good to do the biopsy for two reasons. Number one, you are sure that this is tuberculosis. And number two, about the culture and about the sensitivity patron, because nowadays a lot of cases are multi-drug resistant tuberculosis. So very good. I just want to make a comment. You know, there are better ways to get AIDS than to have it from a patient like you know. Much better ways of getting it than to have it from a patient. But yeah, very good. Are you going to talk about management after this, yeah? Is that right? Yes. Yes. So yeah. this is, uh, just want to know how many of you know this place? Or how many of you have actually gone this to this place? I've been to it, uh, uh, Arif You have been there? Yes, I was taken as a guest of somebody. Oh. It was amazing. Wow, great. I think so, the biggest problem I had was, um, although I did not realize it, but I was feeling a lot of coughs and I was told that it was because my oxygen therapy was not doing well. So I was having breathlessness. <laughs> but other than that, it, it was an amazing place to go. Exactly. It's, it's like 12,500 uh, feet altitude. And this is the highest uh, polo ground in the world. And this is in Pakistan. It's amazing. We people move all around the world, but this is something which is not there in any part of the world. And this uh, maneuver, you must have seen polo in other places, but I this have, is totally yeah. different polo. But I, I spoke totally to this guy, uh, the guy who took me, he was a colleague of mine from school, medical school, mm -hmm. and he told me that they beat all visitors because their horses are not acclimatized. So when exactly. they come, they have planes, they bring their horses and everything down there. And when they play, they lose because their horses were never acclimatized. So this is their right. they, they say that they, if they actually, want to play somebody properly, they should bring their horses in 15 to 20 days before. They actually take their horses two months before the tournament. Yes. It, it takes them two months to acclimatize. And this is extremely fast polo. And there is no foul. As long as you are at the back of the horse and you are hitting the ball, you are okay, there's no foul, you have to take it to the goal. Uh, unlike the, the boring polo which we see on TV, 
uh, you must go and visit this place. This is in uh, six hours from Chatra. Good. Yes. So any question, guys, before we move on? Yes. Uh, one question. Uh, what you can do is write your question on a piece of paper. When we finish, we can do it all together then. Is that okay? Yes, sir. Okay, good. So, uh, uh, Arif Saab, you can continue. For a okay. moment, Shad Nur Saab also joined. Did you notice that? Uh, no, I didn't. Yeah, he was there for about five minutes. He was listening to what you were saying. <laughs> okay. I think he's doing a talk tomorrow on arthroplasty. And he wanted to see how the system works. Okay, 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 okay. okay. Okay, so uh, let's talk about um, the management. So you need to share your video uh, uh, PowerPoint presentation, sir, like again. Okay, okay. You press share and find your presentation. And where is that thing? Can you see it? Yeah. Yes, yes. sir, we got it. Thank you. So, okay now? Yes, sir. Okay. Yes. So the, uh, the management of TB spine would depend on the duration of the disease then on the susceptibility of the organism, then the neurological involvement and the deformity. And in almost all these cases, the management would be chemotherapy with or without surgery. So this is very simple, isn't it? Yes. So when would you like to do uh, surgery? Uh, since the slide is there, so when there are no signs of clinical improvement after a trial of four to six weeks of therapy. So you have started the patient on ATT and the patient is not responding in six weeks. There's a time when you want to do uh, surgery, operate on this function. Uh, when the patient develops neurology, the patient has already developed neurology when he has come to you and you, you're thinking about the management or you have started the chemotherapy and the patient develops neurology while, the, while he's still using the chemotherapy. That's uh, one indication where would you like to operate because that means that he is not responding to the chemotherapy. The third would be a progressive deformity. Uh, deformity, which most importantly, if it is progressive. Now, the fourth, when there are pressure effects of the abscess. And this is more uh, uh, pertinent to cervical spine. Then, when there's doubtful diagnosis, like you have started uh, the patient empirically on tuberculosis uh, and, and on chemotherapy, you haven't done the uh, biopsy, you think clinically and hematologically and x-ray wise, this is tuberculosis, you start the patient on ATT. And after six weeks, uh, he's not responding. And the, you doubt your diagnosis, that's where you can go for surgery. And finally, the disease has already healed and the patient was all right. And then he develops paraplegia, which like we discussed in the previous uh, talk, this is called as paraplegia of late onset. So all this become an indication for surgery. But just to um, uh, emphasize one thing, that the indication for surgery would vary from center to center, place to place, and depending on the facilities available. So if uh, there's a good spine center available, you may actually do surgery in even in, uh, in, in early part of the infection because the objective would be to do debridement. Like any other infection, when you do debridement, it helps in the cure of the infection. It helps the chemotherapy to become more effective because it reduces the load of the organism in that area, 
it takes off the sequestrum, it improves the blood supply in that area, and it prevents the deformity from happening and from progressing. But if you do not have the facilities, you may like to start with the chemotherapy, and then only if the patient develops neurology or deformity, you may, ref you may like to refer that patient to a center where he can be operated. So uh, are we, are you following? Hello? Yes, yes. yes. Uh, I just muted the responses so that they can listen because there is a lot of them having wives and children shouting in the background. Yeah. Uh, they are very brave people. Yes, yeah. yeah, Dr. Arif, we are following you. We are listening, we are listening you very carefully. Okay, we are listening you keenly. Good. So, uh, just to. We are rather, we are enjoying your talk. Oh, that's great. That's great. I'm enjoying it. Uh, just to give you a history of the uh, evolution of the surgical treatment, the first, yes. the first surgery was done by uh, Chepard in 1896, and he actually did laminectomy for tuberculosis. Then in the same year, Millard did a costal transversectomy, and you know costal transversectomy is like an incision drainage. Uh, and uh, that was a wonderful surgery at that time because it drained the abscess. And so the pressure effect of the abscess was gone and it helped the, the improvement of the symptom of the patient. Then in 1933, uh, Kapner developed a procedure called his lateral rechotomy, where he would go from the posterior lateral side and do the debridement. But these all were mainly debridement procedures. Then in the 1952, the anterior decompression and fusion, which is a classical operation, very famous operation described by Hodgson in Hong Kong, uh, that was developed. And finally, nowadays, uh, the procedure which is becoming more and more common is the combined anterior and posterior decompression and fusion, which we can do either using two approaches or you can do both the procedure to the posterior approach only. So this is the uh, absolute, uh, this is the costal transfer sectomy. and here we go through the midline, and we remove the transverse uh, process, and we remove this part of the vertebral uh, uh, rib, and after we remove it, then we are directly onto the abscess. So we are actually going alongside the spinal cord and entering into the vertebral bodies, but this is we do with this approach, so we can drain this abscess. If there is flank first, uh, we can drain, a, we can remove a bit of necrotic material, but we cannot reach to this part. We cannot reach to this part. And uh, this is just to show the abscesses which can form in the source region. This, they can be really huge. They can present here, here, or they can sometimes present in the thigh, you know, beneath the inguinal ligament. Okay, so what are the objectives of surgical treatment? Because whenever you start thinking about surgery, you must have few objectives which you want to achieve. And the objectives here are debridement, uh, the first. The second is to correct the deformity. And the third is to stabilize the spine. And the fourth and the most important would be to decompress the spinal cord if there is spinal cord compression. Now, this is the capnal lateral rechotomy. And here, the incision is not in the midline. The incision is about uh, 8 to 10 centimeter lateral to the midline. And we remove that uh, piece of the rib from the angle of the rib to its insertion, its attachment uh, to the uh, posterior part of the vertebrae. And when that is removed, then we have more uh, access to the Later side of the vertebral body, and we can more easily remove the abscess. So this is a, a much better approach than the uh, costal transversectomy, but it has the same limitations that you cannot reach to the whole of the vertebral body, and you cannot reach to the part immediately in front of the spinal cord, and we cannot do, uh, we cannot provide anterior support. You cannot put bone strut bone grafting here, you cannot do K 
caging here. But you can do very good debridement through this approach. So usually this, uh, this procedure is still done nowadays, uh, but it's reserved for those cases where the general condition of the patient is such that it, uh, the patient cannot sustain a major uh, spine surgery. And there is a large abscess which is compressing on the spinal cord and we need to drain it. So we can do a simple procedure like uh, costotransocytomy or lateral dracotomy. And this is particularly more useful in children. Now, this is uh, one of our patients. This we operated uh, in 1990s. And if you can see, uh, this is anterolateral decompression. And this patient has got 64 degree of kyphosis. And he is two and a half months post-op. So two and a half months post-op, you would expect that the deformity has been corrected and it's not progressing. But this patient still has got 64 degrees of deformity. And this is the problem with this capnus anterolateral decompression because we cannot correct the deformity and we cannot stop the progress of the deformity. So it only drains the abscess. There's no correction of the deformity. There is no prevention of the deformity. And it may still be practical in selected cases where there's tense abscess without bony destruction. Now, this is the, uh, the Hong Kong operation. It started in 1952. And uh, in this approach, uh, either through thoracotomy or through trans-abdominal uh, approach, the spine is approached from the front side. And it has uh, logic because the infection most commonly is in the anterior part of the body, is in the anterior elements of the, uh, of the spine, uh, not in the posterior elements. So instead of going through the posterior elements, why not to go directly through the anterior approach and remove all the infection focus. So they remove all this uh, necrotic material. Uh, and at the end, naturally, there would be a large crater, large space produced, and that is filled with strut grafting because there has to be some structural support in this area. Now, initially, they used um, rib grafts, and they put it there, and they augmented it with... Uh, uh, POP casting in the form of a jacket. And you can see in many of these cases, these, these graft, they worked, they incorporated well into the vertebral bodies. This is again uh, one of our case. Uh, you can see there is loss of this height here. There was infection of the L2-3 and this is the pre-op uh, uh, AP view. And you can see again here in the AP with the loss of disc height here. And this is nine month post-op. And the uh, surgery was anterior debridement and fusion. You cannot see the, uh, the iliac crest graft that was used here. This uh, operation was done again in the early 90s uh, when I was a resident at that time. So uh, we did that. And this is nine month post-op. And you can see the, the no progression of deformity. The, the surgery has really worked. This is another patient. This is six month post-op and you can still see the rib graft which we were using at that time. But you can also appreciate that there is deformity in this area. And this deformity is because this rib graft is not very strong and this cannot prevent the progress of the deformity very effectively. Uh, this is again another of our patient and this is pre-op and this is 40 degrees of deformity and in the immediate post-op we went through the front, we corrected the deformity and we put this rib graft there and the deformity was reduced to 20 degrees. But if you see, this is a few months, it's three months probably, three months post-op, and the deformity has progressed back to 38 degrees 
way it was before the surgery. So again, this is just to emphasize that these graphs, strut graphs, are not very effective in controlling the progression of the deformity. But still, this is very effective operation because it debrides and removes all the sequestrum, it drains the abscess, and it removes the necrotic material. And uh, you can do culture sensitivity, you can do histopathology, and it improves the effect of the chemotherapy as well. So this problem was coming again and again, that the deformity is not 100% uh, prevented. And this was because of the weak uh, graft. So that was the time when people start thinking about the use of metals, metal cages. And the first metal cage was, uh, actually these metal cages were being used in horses uh, quite long ago. And the first one was used in humans in 1996. Uh, that was the time when this became like the procedure of choice and became very popular and like millions of cages were then being used in the later part of uh, 1990s. And that's how it looked like. This is the lung and this, all this uh, debridement has been done. And you can see there's a big gap because two vertebral bodies have been removed and there has to be something to fill this gap. And this is a titanium cage and this is filled with bone graft and this is snugly fitted. So it takes the weight of the body and uh, it is much more stronger than the strut graft in preventing the deformity. Uh, this is again one of our case. And uh, just to go back to the previous slide. So you see the, the cage is lying there between the two vertebral bodies. And where from it, is it getting the stability? The stability is coming from the flexion forces, the forces which are compressive forces in this area. And they are compressing the cage among the two parts of the vertebrae. Now this can be very, uh, this is very good in thoracic spine because they are all flexion forces. Uh, there's no extension in that area. But what happens in lumbar spine? Lumbar spine, there can be compression where the cage would be very effective, but there can be extension as well. And these cages are not very stable in extension. They can actually uh, slip out. And therefore, in case of lumbar spine, we always augment them with these anterior screws and drawers or a plate and screws so that no extension can actually cause distraction in this area and the cage should not become loose. And you can see this is eight years post-operatively and there is no progression of the deformity and alignment is well maintained both in the lateral view and in the AP view. This is uh, another patient, 20 years old, uh, L3, L4 tuberculosis, and again, a cage and uh, screws and rods, and this is one year follow-up, and there's no progression of the deformity. So you can see this is like a medical operation for, tu for tuberculosis, where we can actually do debridement, and we can achieve very good stabilization, and that's why this operation became uh, popular very, uh, rapidly throughout the world. You can do the same procedure in the cervical spine as well. This is uh, C4-5, and you can see this is the abscess, and this is two vertebral bodies involvement. And what we can do is, we, because this abscess is also compressing on the spinal cord, you can see the size of the cord has been reduced. So we go from the front, we remove both these vertebral bodies, we remove the, the abscess, and we can put their graft or cage or whatever, and uh, we can support the spine in that region. And this is what we have done. We have used actually strut graft and augment them with plate and screws. But soon, when we started doing them uh, in large volumes and everybody was doing it and everybody thought this is the best surgery, we, saw, uh, we started seeing uh, problems along, uh, actually created are coming out of these uh, cages. And the uh, common 
the most common problem were subsidence. And why subsidence happens? Because the cage is metal, it's very hard, it's very strong. The bone is not that much strong and the cage can actually protrude, penetrate into the bone. And when it penetrates into the bone, there is deformity progression. Now, again, if there is uh, deformity, which is very severe, and uh, in one of our studies, we have seen that if the deformity is more than 30 degrees, the kyphosis is more than 30 degrees, it is actually very difficult to connect it uh, through the anterior approach alone. And even if we connect it through the anterior approach and put a cage like this, this is going to recur. Like in this case, the deformity was partially corrected, but very soon it become, uh, the, the deformity progressed. And in this case, there's every possibility that this cage may actually uh, be pushed back posteriorly, and this by itself can be a source of compression by the spinal cord. And then there is severe uh, kyphosis, severe sagittal abnormality in this case. So this is another problem with these cages particularly when there's more severe deformities. Then there is displacement. You can see the cage is being displaced and there is again uh, progression of the deformity. And this is another one. You can see that this collapse here and the screws have pulled out. The plate is not holding and the deformity is again is progressing and is not only progressing, but the cage is pushing back. And this might actually compress the spinal cord, leading by itself to paraplegia. So the second option, uh, the other option could be posterior decompression and stabilization. So just to uh, remind you, just posterior decompression, just laminectomy, for the treatment of tuberculosis is a contraindication. Never, never do posterior decompression for tuberculosis when it's involving the anterior elements. And why? Because the anterior elements have already been destroyed by tuberculosis and you are destroying the posterior elements. So what's holding the spine? You are actually making it much more unstable than it was. So just posterior decompression is a contraindication However, you can do posterior decompression and augment it with posterior stabilization. So this is something that you can do in selected cases. And what can be those selected cases? These can be when there's not uh, much uh, necrosis, where there's no big abscess formation, when there's no deformity, but the patient's symptoms are severe, the patient pain is severe, so you can stabilize and by stabilizing, the pain will be reduced and the deformity would not progress. Or you can use this approach in, um, uh, in, in cases where there are multiple foci of infection. Sometimes you can see tuberculosis in different areas. You can see L1 and then L2 and L3 is okay. And then you will see L4 uh, involved by tuberculosis again. So in that case, doing anterior approach becomes difficult uh, in order to have access to two different places. So you can have posterior approach and stabilization uh, much more easily than the anterior. But generally, this posterior stabilization and posterior decompression uh, surgery is not liked very much if it is done alone for the tuberculosis. And uh, uh, the problem with this posterior stabilization and decompression is uh, that you cannot correct the deformity and it's difficult to maintain uh, the correction because there is no anterior support provided. Because in order to prevent the progression of deformity, you need two things. Number one, a tension band that can actually hold the posterior column. And number two, an anterior support in the vertebral bodies. So if the anterior support is deficient, no matter how strong your posterior construct is, the deformity would progress. The screws would pull out, the bone would break, and the deformity would progress. So uh, this is a case of severe deformity. 
Uh, and in these cases, the, the choice then becomes a two column approach, uh, anterior approach and posterior approach. And this can be staged or we can use a posterior approach only and again going all the way anteriorly and posteriorly and correcting deformity anteriorly and putting a cage anteriorly and then putting the screws posteriorly but without having any anterior incision. Uh, this is uh, one of our, our case uh, and this is posterior stabilization. Now there are certain difficult situations and what are those difficult situations? These are mainly the junctions. Uh, for example, the cervicothoracic junction, the thoracolumbar junction and lumbosacral junction. And what is the problem with cervicothoracic junction if you want to go from the front? Because there are major vessels in that area and we have to mobilize all those major vessels in order to reach to the vertebral bodies. Uh, thoracolumbar junction, what is the problem there? We have a diaphragm and we have to cut the diaphragm in order to reach there, which again has its own morbidities. And then lumbosacral junction. Now, what are the problems with the lumbosacral junction? That there is a big swass muscle on both the sides and inside swass muscle, there are a large, or a, a large number of nerves. There is lumbo, lumbar plexus, lumbosacral plexus, which are actually hidden in, in the substance of the source. And if you want to cut the source and reach the vertebral body, you may actually damage those nerve roots, and which again by itself can cause severe disability. Now, another problem uh, situation would be when there's extensive bone loss anteriorly uh, and causing severe deformity, then uh, severe deformity Correcting it only from the anterior approach would become very difficult. And as I said, when the deformity crosses the 30 degrees limit, then it becomes very difficult to be corrected from the anterior approach. And even if you are able to correct it, it usually progresses. Then uh, in case of heel tuberculosis, when there is severe kyphosis, and particularly when there is uh, paraplegia of late onset, uh, just one anterior approach would be very difficult for this uh, for the correction. Mm, we have to use both anterior and posterior approaches. So these are the difficult situations and what to do in these cases. So the options with us in these cases would be to use two approaches. Uh, and one, we go through anterior approach, we do debridement of the anterior column, then we stabilize it. By, uh, by using stud grafts or by using cages. And then as a second approach, as a second procedure, we go from the back, do posterior stabilization and fusion. So there are two approaches, two surgeries basically, are now uh, more commonly used for the past few years. We can use only one approach but you can, we can do both the procedures using this one posterior approach. So in this one posterior approach, uh, we usually have a midline approach, uh, spine is approached, uh, we do the posterior decompression, we expose the spinal cord, the dura, everything, and then we go along the sides of the vertebral bodies, and then we remove the vertebral bodies piecemeal, a uh, little bit by bit, and we can actually remove multiple vertebral bodies in, in this fashion. And once they are all removed and debrided, debrided and a big crater has been created, that crater can be filled with a cage that again we can pass from the posterior approach also. So we can do uh, very effective anterior decompression and anterior stabilization and posterior stabilization by this approach. And this is one of our case, and you can see this is the upper part of the thoracic, meaning this is a difficult area. All the major vessels, the arch of the aorta and out, everything is here. And of course we can go through the front, but we will need help from a thoracic surgeon. And the morbidity is actually quite high in this case because we have to 
use through the uh, the sternal approach and then reach here and then do the debridement. And since the deformity is severe, correcting this deformity would be difficult. And even if you are able to correct it, maintaining this deformity would be difficult. So in this case, we choose to use the posterior approach and do uh, both the anterior and posterior decompression and stabilization. And there are just a few slides of the procedure. So if you can see, this is the spinal cord going in. And these are the pedicles that have been placed in and st spine is stabilized from the back. And then we go alongside, and this is the curate that we are using. And we are curating the vertebral bodies along the sides, piece by piece. And you can see this crater actually has been created. And we are going along the sides. And you can see this cavity along the sides. Same. This is the osteotome that we are using uh, on the vertebral bodies and protecting the spinal cord. With this, we break the vertebral bodies, remove it. And then you can see that the cage has been pushed into that crater and it has been fixed. And we compresses the vertebral bodies on both the sides. And then we use the rods. So the spine is stabilized. The spine is decompressed. All the necrotic material bodies both the bodies have been removed. It has been stabilized in the front. Then it has been stabilized in the back. It has been fused in the back. And there's only one approach for it. And we can actually correct considerable deformities with this approach. So this is how it looks in the post-op. Uh, both the anterior debridement and stabilization with the cage and the posterior screws and the rods and all through the posterior approach. This is another case, and again, upper thoracic, and you can see there is severe deformity. And if you see this uh, the, the MRI, a much closer look, this is almost an 80 degree of deformity here. So this will be, and this is upper part of a thoracic spine. So it will be very difficult to reach to this area because to reach to the apex of the kyphosis through the front is uh, becomes very difficult because the space is very narrow here. Even if you reach there, correcting this deformity is very difficult. And then even if you are able to correct it, maintaining it is almost impossible. So the best approach in this case would be to go from the posterior and do both the anterior procedure and the posterior approach, posterior procedure through the same this. And this is how we did. And you can see the deformity has been corrected considerably. There is no that kyphosis, normal kyphosis, normally there are 45 degree kyphosis, which is here. And there's anterior debridement and the spine is stabilized both from the front and the back. So this you can see before the surgery and this you can see after the surgery. This is another patient, 30 years old male with a history of interscapular pain for the last six months and weakness of both the lower limbs and difficulty in walking for the last one week. In an examination, there is gibbous in the upper thoracic spine, tenderness, uh, brisk reflexes, and unstable gait. And these are the x-rays. So this was seen somewhere and they thought there's nothing wrong and they gave uh, in the jazz six, uh, and he was like this for a month or so till he developed this weakness and then he presented to us. And when we did the MRI, this was the MRI, you can see there is involvement of the T3 and T4 with the necrotic material going back and compromising the spinal cord. This is T1 and this is T2. And this is how we did, we went from the back and we corrected the deformity. And this is the fibular graft that we used. This is actually a younger patient. So we use fibular strut graft in this case. Uh, it's cheaper uh, because we don't have to pay for the cages. So sometimes we use this and then we stabilize from the back as well. This is another case, T4-5 and uh, correction of the deformity and stabilization, again, through the posterior approach. This is another one. 
uh, deformity correction. This is the lumbar region. And you can see again this. Now this is the lumbar spine. And lumbar spine, if we go from the front, we will come across the sauce and we will come across the lumbar sacral plexus. And this, this is, there's every possibility that those plexus, the nerve roots might be damaged. So it becomes uh, more easier to go from the back and do the decompression and the same stabilization, both anterior and posterior. And this is what we did. So this construct is much more stable than only anterior because this is stable both in flexion and extension. This is L5-S1, one of the most difficult locations. Uh, again, it can be done through the same approach. Three, four, similar approach. And this is see severe deformity. And this deformity was corrected through this approach and uh, again, achieving all the objectives. This deformity otherwise would not be, we just cannot uh, corrected using only the anterior approach. And this is uh, uh, one of our case, she was 30 years old and she had this tuberculosis when she was a child. And she was operated at that time and you can see the wires, the circulage wire that were used at that time, probably used uh, rods as well, which have been removed. And the, uh, the patient did well and she recovered and she grew up. And then the deformity progressed and she developed this severe deformity and then weakness of both the lower limbs. So the main problem was severe pain and weakness in the lower limbs. And she presented at the age of 30 years to us, like 20, 25 years after the original infection. And uh, when we uh, did a 3D CT scan, that's how the, the CT is. You can see there is severe deformity in this area. That's how you, you can see it here. And uh, again, we went through the posterior approach and we uh, removed all that gibbous, that vertebral bodies, which were actually causing the problem. And uh, after we removed the anterior part of the vertebral body and we removed the posterior part of the vertebral body, but we could actually manipulate the whole of the spine to any of the position we wanted. So we corrected the deformity, uh, put a cage in the front to give anterior support, put screws in the back, stabilize it, and the deformity was corrected. And this is the uh, patient after the surgery, and you can see that there's no deformity in this area now. And this is one year post-op, and you can see there's no progression of the deformity. So just to summarize, many patients may be left with chronic back pain, but not loss of function. About 60% of them, so when they are treated with chemotherapy alone, uh, the, the infection would be treated. They would have some back pain for the rest of their lives, but the neurology would stay intact and they can perform reasonably as long as the function is concerned. A small portion of them would develop paraplegia. And uh, then another 15% at an average would have some neurological deficit. So our objective is that this should not happen. This should not happen. And this back pain should not happen too. Because if a patient has got back pain for the rest of his life, this can be severe disability. Uh, the problem with the surgery is that it's long duration surgery. There can be hemodynamic problems. You need good expertise uh, to perform these surgeries and there can be complications. So if there is only back pain and systemic symptoms, uh, you can do the biopsies whenever there is possible. And when it comes like out to be FB, you can do a uh, chemo, you can start with chemotherapy. Now there is no deformity, there is no neurology, you can start with the chemotherapy and uh, this patient actually can become fine without any surgery. Now, how much 
chemotherapy is uh, has to be given this again uh, varies from uh, place to place and according to the latest uh, um, uh, this who working party on tuberculosis report they recommend six months of chemotherapy uh, in areas where the disease is not very endemic so in developed area world they recommend six months of chemotherapy we generally recommend nine months of chemotherapy and just uh, to have uh, or we can discuss it later as well so uh, for the management of tuberculosis we need to have early diagnosis uh, very good medical treatment. It should be started very early. There should be aggressive surgical approach if you want to correct the deformity, if you want to prevent the deformity. And when the deformity is prevented, the deformity is corrected, the disease is controlled, we can expect very good outcome in this case. Uh, thank you. And now let's uh, do some discussion. So can I make a comment, sir? I was, yes. I was working in Birmingham with, with uh, Alistair Thompson and Alistair Sterling. So they were moving from, uh, well, they were not doing infection, they, uh, tumor, they were doing basically tumors and they were moving from the fibula to the cage, the titanium cage, and they were going posteriorly to approach it. And uh, the chap who was selling the kit had tickets for the test match between Pakistan and England. So th he gave them five VIP tickets and the boss threw them in the rubbish bin because he was not a big fan of cricket. And that is the day I started hating spines because I was not allowed to go and see a cricket match. Anyway, this was anecdotal. All of you guys, if you have questions quickly, it's getting late. I know it's getting very late. Arif Saab has been very kind, but we don't want to keep him awake too much. But quickly, if you have a few questions, maybe four or five of them all together, then we can we call it a day. Yeah? It's been a long day for Arif Saab also. Uh, uh, yes, sir. Uh, one query, I have, sir. Yes. Sir, uh, when, we, when we have uh, infections uh, in the long bones, we usually avoid putting up metallic implants uh, inside due to risk of implant infection. Yes. But in the case of spine, you uh, use uh, these titanium cages and metallic implant inside. So are you not worried about uh, implant infections? Uh, uh, there are uh, a few things that I can say about this. Number one, when uh, there is infection in the long bone and you have already used an implant and that implant is providing stability, do you remove it? No, we don't remove it as long as it is providing stability because stability by itself can actually help in the treatment of the infection. Number one. Number two, in the long bones, we have the option of external fixation. In the spine, we do not have the option of external fixation. Number three, uh, titanium implants have been shown to have a lower incidence of uh, developing biofilms as compared to stainless steels. And tuberculosis do not develop these biofilms. So uh, in tuberculosis, actually, they are quite safe. But even in pyogenic infections, uh, titanium implants are quite safe. And in spine, we use them routinely both at the site of the infection in the form of the cage and away from the infection in the form of the pedicle screws. But just to add what you said, Arif Saab, a stable infection is far better than an unstable infection. This is something you guys must remember. An unstable infection, a stable infection is far better than an unstable infection. And that's why you have to fix them uh, in, 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 in spine cases. Oh, got it. Thank you, sir. Go on then, guys, hurry up. Question time before you lose it. What do you think of, of this uh, forum, uh, Arif Saab? I think it's great. Uh, and uh, I actually enjoy it because uh, I'm in a very relaxed mode uh, uh, and uh, discussing. The only thing is I cannot see the faces of all of them, so I don't know how many of them are sleeping. There's about 16 of them. <laughs> And, and there is an arrow that you can go at the top if you wanted to. So saying that, you know, this is for a forum for exams, but we have tried this forum internationally. So it's amazing that we have about 10 different countries uh, doing our, uh, the sports injury forum that we have started. And we have everybody participating. So it's an international uh, uh, thing. We can all co contribute from wherever we are. Like you said, we're all relaxed. We don't have to wear suits and ties and we don't get prepared to go there. But anyway, question time, please. Sir, my question, my name is... Uh... Malik Osama, I'm uh, in this hospital, uh, working in Indus hospital as a resident. 
in uh, one mock examination in uh, uh, in AQ, Dr. Soil Rafi asks uh, me about tuberculosis spine management. He asks uh, if you uh, go for the interior decompression and stabilization of a TB spine uh, from where, left side or the right side. Uh, so, what will be the uh, uh, ideal site for approaching uh, interior decompression and fusion of the TB spine? So, what was your answer? <laughs> Sir, my <laughs> answer would be left, uh, left side. Why? Uh, because uh, aorta is on the left side and it is uh, 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 inferior vena cava on the right, uh, right side. Uh, and aorta is uh, more control, uh, controlled than the inferior vena cava. So, uh, you see, there is no 100% uh, correct answer to this. Uh, the easier answer would be to use, most of the people, they use the left side. Because it's easy to handle the aorta than the vena cava. But then there are many people who can go from both the sides and they see the CT scan and the MRI and see where actually most of the infection is. If the infection is on the right side, involving the right part of the vertebral body, they would actually go from the right side and uh, they can handle with the vena cava and uh, they would like to uh, go from the right side. But most of the people uh, whom I know and what the literature suggests, they would like to go from the left side. Okay. And if it is a multi-level uh, uh, TB spine and a patient has a neurological symptom, then what uh, would be the ideal situation? What would be the ideal surgery for this patient? So just like I said, now you have the, uh, what are the options? The, one of the option is do like we do in the classical uh, one focus infection. You go from the front for one area and then you have another approach for the other area. But then you have two surgeries, you have two approaches and you have more morbidity. The other option would be go from the back uh, and uh, you stabilize the spine using a long construct both up and down and doing the decompression. Uh, for the neurology, uh, where, where it is compressing the spine. So in that case, we can avoid the two approaches and we can, do, uh, we can achieve our results using one approach. But then again, it depends on the severity of the infection and the deformity. So if there is severe deformity, then this approach may not be uh, sufficient. Sure, yeah. Doctor, tell you, what, you, you need to surprise your examiner by asking him a return question. If it tells you where you want to go, you need to ask him, sir, where is the problem? What level is it? Is it thoracic? Is it cervical or is it lumbar? Then you need to ask them that how bad is the deformity? And you need to ask them that how long is the deformity? When you ask all these questions, you forget his question, but then you start answering your question. So never get caught in a situation like this, okay? You must always control the exam. Arif Sahib has done a very good presentation. If you remember half of it, you'll do well. He has told you what to do in difficult areas. He has also told you what is contraindicated, what is not indicated. If you really listen to what he has said today, the best way to do that is to go from the back, take everything out on both sides, put a cage in it, and then stabilize it posteriorly. That is the best option, and you have to give them chemotherapy for nine months if you diagnose this as tuberculosis. That, that is the answer. If you gave me the exam, I doubt if anybody have, would have the you know, um, decency to failure, like that, that is the best possible answer. Thank you. Are we all happy? So let me uh, ask yes. one, one more question, sir. Yeah. Okay. Uh, sir, uh, you mentioned uh, five to six surgical indications for TB spine. Yes. Uh, but uh, when we have a pyogenic infection, Mm -hmm. uh, the surgical indications are same or uh, uh, something else is there? Surgical indications are almost the same. You see, you, you have to tailor your indication according to your objectives. And your objectives are number one, to, achieve, to get diagnosis. Number two, debridement. Number three, stabilization. And these are objectives both in case of pyogenic as well as in tuberculosis. Okay, thank you, sir.
I think guys is getting late. We need to get Arif Sab go back to sleep. So Arif Sab, thank you very much again. Manohar, before we uh, stop, let me ask them a question. Oh, good. I like that. So, <laughs> you have a patient and uh, you did whatever you wanted to do and you have started chemotherapy. Now, when are you going to stop the chemotherapy? When the patient clinical symptoms uh, have subsided and there is no progression of diseases and the ESR and CRP is uh, on a decreasing trend and uh, there is again the, uh, the fatty uh, the, in, on the MRI spine, there is no, uh, there is return of the or, original uh, uh, bonus, uh, uh, bonus stock of the vertebrae. So let me tell you, all this will happen in three months time. Yes, sir. But for uh, uh, TB, the infection uh, irradiation will be a more, uh, nine months because uh, there are still the TB bacteria is colonizing the soft tissues. So you will continue till nine months and then you will stop the chemotherapy? Yes. Every case? Uh, <laughs> Not, uh, uh, not sure. But, but you've answered your question yourself. You know, you could say that you will keep repeating these investigations. You have to give treatment yes. for minimum of nine months. You will review them uh, frequently. And if you have a, a, a investigations and tests which are telling you everything is under control and you have gone to the gold mark of nine months, then maybe you can stop your treatment. So you've answered the question, but you need to, to listen to what Arif Saab is also saying here. Yeah? So uh, you will stop the uh, chemotherapy when the patient has responded symptomatically and uh, when the ESR has dropped down to normal and when the ESR stays normal for three consecutive months. Okay. okay. So you, you uh, do ESR at month six and it's normal, you do it at seven, it's normal, you do it at eight, it's normal, so you stop at nine months. Many okay. times, ESR will stay high. And then you are not supposed to stop the ATT at nine months. You will continue it. Sometime you may have to carry uh, the chemotherapy tool two years. Okay. And then you might to have to consider the multi-drug resistance and other things. So there is no fixed time where you will say, I will stop the chemotherapy at nine months. No. You will say the minimum is nine months. But I will tailor it according to the patient's symptoms and the hematology and the x-rays. Okay, fine. Thank you. I think we need to close it. It's getting very late in Pakistan. I just want to ask a question for, from Arif Saab. Why do we yes. get people to come at six weeks, 12 weeks, three months, six months, nine months? Do you know a reason for that? Uh, for follow-up? Yeah. Even test we do. It is a multiple of six weeks. So I'll tell you what it is. <laughs> We were told about this on one of the BOA meetings. So, mm -hmm. uh, Sir so, so Watson John told the general surgeons that orthopedics is an orthopedic problem and trauma is an orthopedic problem. So you get lost and we will live after all the trauma in the whole of UK. So then he had six senior registrars and he, used, he sent all six senior registrars into a different part of UK. And he used to visit each of them one week. So if you had a problem, you call, you, you want to show it to your boss, you brought it back in a month of city. <laughs> So that when he was around, you could discuss it with him. So there is no scientific reason for it. It is just because he <laughs> goes to come in every six weeks to see everybody. But Dr. Ari will tell the reason. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that, that is what we were told in one of the BA meetings. You know? That's why we have six weeks, 12 weeks, three months, six months, nine months, all multiples of six. Anyway, thank you very much. Sir. Um, it was a pleasure. And um, please don't be a stranger. Join us sometime. And, and hopefully we will have more of your, your teachings, you know, but we, we have made a good forum and we're all progressing well. And I have a good feeling about my boys, you know, they will all do well, inshallah. Yeah? Okay. Great, and, great, uh, Manavo. Thank you, Emerson. Thank you, boys. Good thank night. you, sir. Thank, thank you very much. Good thank night. You, thank you. Thank you, sir. Jazakallah.